this lunch uh, symposium with Professor uh, Peter Gans from uh, San Francisco, UCSF, um, San Francisco General Hospital, Chief of Cardiology. Um, and uh, this lunch session is uh, sponsored by Itamar Medical, and obviously it's dedicated to discuss a very important and interesting topic, which is endothelial function assessment uh, ready for clinical use. We have a terrific uh, panel of speakers. Uh, we are going to start with the first talk. We'll try uh, to finish no later than uh, 2.30 uh, sharp, which means we have approximately uh, half an hour for each uh, lecture. Uh, so I think that uh, we'll start with the first talk. Uh, uh, the first speaker is going to be Professor uh, uh, Michael Schechter from Shiba Medical Center, followed by Dr. <laughs> Professor Amir Lerman, followed by Professor Giora Pilar. And the first topic is uh, the management of cardiovascular risk. And I would ask each uh, lecturer to uh, reserve some time for questions, mainly questions from the audience. So we'll try to make it uh, interactive. So Michael, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, to, I'm uh, glad, uh, I honored to be here, especially now, you know, if uh, Fogel uh, was here, he would say that during or after this lunch, at least uh, six hours, your endothelial function will be blunted. So. I hope uh, at least you will be able to uh, listen and, and see what uh, we are having. This is my disclosure. So uh, almost 35 years ago, uh, Frukut and uh, Zadavsky uh, presented their results in the Nature uh, Journal uh, showing that uh, acetylcholine indu uh, induced vasodilation in a, a rabbit aortic uh, 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 ring with intact endothelium, but uh, the same uh, uh, way they showed also that the acetyl induced vasoconstriction in uh, aortic uh, ring, but with damaged endothelium. This led to uh, the notion of the importance of endothelial function in, uh, in, uh, in clinics and in, in uh, research. 18 years later, uh, Frukud and the other two scientists from the, from the US received uh, uh, the Nobel Prize in Medicine for discovering of the nitric oxide uh, pathway and uh, nearly uh, 30 years of uh, nitric oxide uh, related research reduced the nitric oxide bioavailability as become uh, synonymous with endothelial uh, dysfunction. So uh, today we uh, know uh, that uh, classical as well as a uh, new risk factor for coronary disease all uh, have a, a mutual and, and common pathway by inhibiting uh, the endothelial function, leading to endothelial dysfunction, leading to impaired vasomotion toll, pro, uh, pro thrombotic state, pro inflammatory state, and proliferation of uh, arterial wall. All this leads to cardiovascular disease events. And uh, today, the most common bedside non-invasive tool for assessing of endothelial function are uh, first the brachial artery reactivity testing, and the second are uh, the uh, uh, peripheral uh, endopart, uh, uh, peripheral arterial tonometry uh, made by Itamar. These are the two leading non-invasive bedside uh, uh, tools to assess endothelial function. The question is, does endothelial function provide prognostic information in primary prevention? So uh, we know uh, that the risk factors are strongly uh, related to endothelial dysfunction, and the more risk factors for coronary disease, the lower the endothelial function. Let's uh, see in hypertension, for example, when uh, we assess endothelial function in nearly 1,000 uh, uh, normal subjects, we demonstrated uh, uh, that uh, those with systolic blood pressure above 140 
have uh, uh, less endothelial, uh, dis endothelial functions than those with above the 140 millimeters per mercury. Also, we could uh, show very nicely uh, in ve uh, inverse and, uh, and uh, significant correlation between the pulse pressure and endothelial function in normal volunteers. And when we divided uh, the pulse pressure to below and above the median of 50 millimeters mercury, you could see nicely that those with, uh, with, uh, with pulse pressure above the median, they had lower endothelial functions than those with below the median uh, uh, pulse pressure. In 172 uh, uh, naive hypertension patients with ages 56 uh, years, uh, with a, a normal, a normal a vascular function, I'm sorry, a normal a, a cardiac function regionally and globally, and the endothelial function was measured at a baseline, and patients were followed for almost a, eight a, years. Uh, what they, they uh, found very nicely after a uh, multivariate analysis is those uh, patients with, uh, uh, with uh, flow mediated dilation below the median had significantly much more uh, cardiovascular events than those with below the uh, median. So in Cox's uh, analysis, controlling for age, sex, glycemia, cholesterol, smoking, body mass index, systolic and diastolic blood pressure at baseline and left ventricular mass index, a low uh, FMD, flow mediated dilation, conferred an increased risk of cardiovascular events with the odds ratio of 2.67. What's the correlation between brachial uh, FMD and carotid uh, intermal medial thickness? Uh, Ashimoto uh, assessed intermal medial thickness in uh, a 34 a men with atherosclerosis here in, in uh, red and the 33 age match men without clinical atherosclerosis control here in green. What uh, they found that the uh, intermal medial thickness was significantly higher in those with atherosclerosis or clinical atherosclerosis. Then they also assessed flow mediated dilation and found that those with atherosclerosis had reduced significantly reduced, reduced flow mediation dilation. They also found an inverse and significant correlation between IMT and the flow mediated dilation in subjects without atherosclerosis and in all subjects. When, uh, a, when the a regression, multi, after following a multi, uh, uh, multi uh, regression analysis, found that flow mediated dilation was inversely correlated to IMT. So this finding supports the concept that endothelial dysfunction is significantly related to atherosclerosis. Endothelial dysfunction and uh, a carotid intermal medial sickness are two indicators of subclinical cardiovascular disease. As part of the longitudinal cardiovascular risk in Jan Finn's study, brachial FMD and the carotid IMT were measured in a nearly 2,000 healthy uh, adults aged 24 to 39 years. What uh, they found after multivariant analysis that flow mediated dilation was inversely associated with carotid IMT, and also carotid IMT was inversely and significantly related to uh, flow mediated dilation. Then they divided the uh, entire cohort to tertiles according to the flow mediated dilation and they found an, a, a correlation, significant correlation between the numbers of the risk factor for coronary artery disease and the intimal medial sickness in childhood and adulthood in those with impaired or intermediate flow mediated dilation and impaired flow mediated dilation, but not with enhanced or normal flow mediated dilation. A significantly increase of the IMT uh, in those with more, uh, more risk factors of coronary artery disease. So brachial flow mediated dilation is inversely associated with carotid IMT. The number of risk factors in young adults is correlated with increased IMT 
in subject with evidence of endothelial dysfunction, but not in subject with preserved endothelial function. This observation suggests that endothelial dysfunction is an early event in atherosclerosis and that the status of systematic endothelial function may modify the association between risk factors and atherosclerosis. And ALOPS uh, demonstrate a brachial artery flomidated dilation and carotid IMT in uh, nearly 200 non-smoking British civil servants recruited from a prospective uh, cohort, participating with the age of 45 to 66 years were free of clinical cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And they uh, determined uh, 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 the framingham risk at the baseline and the carotid IMT was repeated after nearly six years. Was de de demonstrated inverse correlation between flow mediated dilation and the progression of carotid IMT. The systemic endothelial function was associated with progression of uh, preclinical carotid artery disease of the, over a six year period and was more closely related to carotid IMT changes than conventional risk factor. Flow mediated uh, dilation testing provides an integrated vascular measure that may aid the prediction of say, structural disease evolution and represent a potential short and intermediate term outcome measure for evaluation of uh, preventive treatment strategies. And in uh, uh, Modena in Italy, what uh, they measure carotid IMT and brachial IOT at baseline and after one year follow-up uh, in 680 hypertensive postmenopausal women with the uh, age of uh, 55, and they found that the uh, median carotid IMT at baseline was inversely correlated with baseline FMD. When uh, they correlated the that the baseline IMT to the tetrals of FMD, what they found that the, the lowest tetral of M FMD was very much uh, uh, indicative of uh, IMT progression compared to the third tetrals with preserved FMD, which was even a demonstrating of, uh, of uh, IMT regression. So in this protective study, a significant uh, interaction between baseline flow-mediated dilation, flow-mediated dilation change during follow-up, and IMT progression were observed in hypertensive postmenopausal women. These results are in accordance with the suggestions that endothelial dysfunction is associated with enhanced atherosclerosis development. This hypothesis could provide pathophysiological explanation for the increase in cardiovascular and cerebrovascular episodes recorded in hypertensive postmenopausal women with endothelial dysfunction. Does endothelial function pr uh, provide information for CD detection? When uh, at 122 uh, uh, patients with chest pain uh, were uh, were uh, taken to coronary angiography, underwent coronary angiography, the FMD provides a sensitivity of 71% and specificity of 81% in CD detection. Those with the coronary artery disease, they had lower, significantly lower endothelial function than those without coronary artery disease. Also, in uh, patients admitted with angina pectoris and underwent coronary angiography, again, the sensitivity for detection of coronary artery disease was 89% and specificity of 77%. While baseline flow dilation, if it was abnormal, predicted long-term adverse cardiovascular event compared to those with normal endothelial function. Thus, normal flomidated dilation in the brachial artery of patients with chest pain appears to be associated with a low-risk cardiac event. What is the long-term prognosis in non-CD subject? We followed 435 middle-aged subjects with no apparent heart disease after controlling for a traditional risk factors or also Framingham risk, we found that those who had the endothelial function below the median, 
they had significantly a much more a cardiovascular events than those who remained above the median. When we extended this uh, trial to 680 subjects and followed them for 7.5 years, we found exactly the same results. Those who had the endothelial function below the median, they had at least three to four uh, fold events more than those with endothelial function above the median, even after controlling for Framingham risk score. Eboa et al. followed the nearly 3,000 uh, healthy volunteers for five years, and they found exactly the same results in the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis. Those who had endothelial uh, function below the median, they had significantly much more event, cardiovascular event, than those who were below the median. FMD again predicted, predicted cardiovascular events even after adjustment for the Framingham risk score. Uh, Yeboah also uh, followed 2,792 adults with the mean age of 78 years for five years. 23% had prior cardiovascular disease and also found exactly the same results. Those with FMD below the median, they had significantly much more cardiovascular events than those who were below the median. And this is elderly uh, population as well. In a prospective study on a nearly 2,000 postmenopausal women with the age of 54, with no car cardiovascular disease and follow up for at least uh, four years, what they found in uh, Italy, that when they divided the population to uh, three tertiles, they found that TIA and CVA were significantly more common in those with the lower tertile compared to the high FMD tertiles. When controlled for, uh, for all the risk factors for coronary disease, the incidence of cardiovascular uh, disease were much, significantly much higher in the lower tertiary of FMD compared to the normal FMD. So in postmenopausal uh, women, the knowledge of FMD provided incremental prognostic information regarding the risk of developing cardiovascular events above and beyond traditional risk factors. And uh, Ronen Rubinstein and Damir Lehrmann followed the 270 patients with the age of 54. 40% had a myocardial infarction with low Framingham risk. And they followed them for seven years with the endopath technique and demonstrated nicely again that those with lower endothelial function had significantly much more event, cardiovascular event, than those who had higher endothelial function. So a low reactive hyperemia signal as detected by the endopart and consistent with endothelial dysfunction was associated with higher adverse event rate during follow-up. Does flow-mated dilation improvement impact outcome in non-CD subjects? Again, from Italy, 400 consecutive postmenopausal women with mild to moderate hypertension and impaired flow-mated dilation at baseline after six months of antihypertensive therapy, flow mediated dilation improved in two thirds of the patient, uh, and they were follow ups later on for six years. What they demonstrated that those who had a persistent impaired flow mediated dilation had significantly much more cardiovascular events than those who improved flow mediated dilation, and this was independent of treatment method and magnitude of blood pressure lowering. What about the syndrome X? Is the uh, endothelial function can uh, be assessed in this uh, subject and what it means? So uh, we, uh, we assessed uh, endothelial uh, function in, uh, in patients with recurrent chest pain and normal coronary arteries. At the beginning, they had uh, uh, impaired endothelial function. We loaded them with l arginine six uh, grams per day for six months compared to usual care and found increase or at, at, at least normalization of the endothelial function. And this was followed by significant uh, re reduction in chest pain in those patients. And this study, although very small, is in accord with Amir Lerman's study taken in the categorization laboratory, showing exactly the same 
seeing that those who were on uh, L-arginine had improved endothelial function. And lastly, the non-invasive endothelial function testing and outcome systematic review of meta-analysis. A publication just in this January in uh, the European Heart Journal and 36 uh, studies for FMD were uh, included in systematic review, of which 32 studies consisting 15,151 individuals were meta-analyzed and with three studies of uh, endo endopart. 76%, nearly 11,000 uh, subjects were without coronary artery disease and 24% with coronary artery disease. Again, three studies followed or assessed those with uh, endopart, comprising 865 patients. What demonstrated in a univariate uh, analysis that uh, for each unit increase of the reactive hyperemia index, there was nearly 18% reduction in cardiovascular events. And in multivariate analysis, each uh, unit increase in reactive hyperemia index associated with 15% reduction in cardiovascular disease. Looking at the 15,000 subject with, uh, with uh, uh, FMD, brachial FMD, for each, uh, with, this is the univariate analysis, with each uh, uh, inc unit increase in flow mediated dilation was associated with significant 10% reduction in all cause mortality and events. And with a multivariate analysis, each unit increase in flow mediated dilation was associated with 10% reduction in cardiovascular events and mortality. Even by uh, analysis to subgroups, Resemblance and they showed exactly the same magnitude for each uh, increase of flow mediated dilation. It doesn't matter if patients who had non cardiovascular uh, disease or with cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular mortality, if the, the, uh, if the FMD was above or below, uh, or if the patients were below 62 or above 62, exactly the same uh, magnitude. So the pooled uh, risk reduction for cardiovascular events and all-cause mortality per 1% increase in the brachial flow mediated dilation adjusting for potential confounders was 0 0.90. In contrast, only three studies evaluated the prognostic value of uh, PAT for cardiovascular events and pooled risk reduction per 0 0.1 increase in reactive hyperemia index was 0 0.85. Thus, brachial FMD and PET are independent predictor of cardiovascular events and all-cause mortality. Thus, we think that endothelial function can reclassify patients' risk, especially those with moderate cardiovascular risk, and better uh, get us or leave us room for better treatment of our patient. Thank you very much. So this presentation is open for discussion. If, if you have any questions. So, Mickey, uh, let me maybe start this. Uh, so, you have a patient who's apparently healthy, so it's primary prevention. The intermediate risk by Framingham or some other formula, and you want to further risk stratify them, and you have options. You could do coronary calcium, you could do ankle brachial index, you could do other tests, including endothelial function. Uh, what are the advantages of, of using endothelial function compared to some of the other modalities? Look, if uh, the patient has a non-specific uh, chest pain, or if the patient is, you know, has a couple of risk factors for coronary disease, of course, the most uh, uh, most uh, bedside, the most easiest way is to to, to assess endothelial function because if if he has uh, impaired endothelial uh, function, I can e immediately advice for very aggressive therapy compared to low uh, therapy or just living as the usual care. So this, it's, first we should uh, know that this is a non-invasive tool. It's non-radiation. It's uh, relatively uh, not expensive compared to the other modalities. It's very handy and it's a bedside tool. 
So uh, I would just start with this, since if uh, the endothelial function is normal, completely normal, then I would say that the risk of the patient is very low. And the, I mean, the one thing I like about endothelial function testing compared to, say, coronary calcium is that the result is modifiable. A coronary calcium is hard to change. Yeah. It, there's, it's hard to monitor. Several studies have shown that. Uh, and endothelial function in contrast is, is changeable, it's mutable. So you have something to monitor in, in patients that you don't get with coronary calcium. Yeah, definitely. This uh, I would never leave the patient alone. I would always uh, recommend the patient after g doing uh, this and that uh, recommendation, come back and I will follow you by the endothelial function assessment. And uh, uh, we did this to several patients as well as I sh re showed you with uh, those with, uh, with chest pain, recurrent chest pain, and normal uh, coronary arteries in the uh, uh, geography room, uh, catheterization room, and we follow these patients. We follow them again and again, and we show that uh, it was completely uh, improved, not just, uh, not just the clinic, the clinic which was mainly improved, but also the endothelial function improved it dramatically. Mickey, you nicely showed the, the distinction between patient with impaired versus a normal endothelial function in terms of uh, cardiovascular prognosis. Now, do you have data to show us that if you take patients with impaired endothelial function and you can uh, intervene and modify and improve their endothelial function, you actually improve their cardiovascular prognosis. Yeah, yeah, definitely, you know. Is there correlation between endothelial function and coronary classifications? Yes, yes, but again, you know, the, the beauty in the endothelial function is that you can see, you can follow and see a change of the endothelial function in time or according to what you give. With the calcification, you don't see. Mostly no, mostly no, but you know, it's a gamma of, of uh, things. Also, I can show you, I can uh, tell you that most patients with coronary artery disease with myocardial infarction, probably they have endothelial dysfunction, but there is variety of, 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 of uh, endothelial dysfunctions. There is low endothelial, moderate, uh, high endothelial dysfunction as well. It's, uh, it's not just yes or no, it's also gradual. We can graduate uh, this. So what is the reason that the test is not yet well integrated in the, in the prevention guidelines, for example? I think mainly because uh, traditionally we used either the invasive procedure, which is not uh, uh, seen in every lab, and the other brachial artery reactivity testing, it's time consuming, it's labor consuming, it's uh, very difficult to do. It's uh, very difficult to learn this. And uh, uh, lastly, during the last uh, decade, we see the end of part. I think with the end of part, when it's uh, much uh, easier to do and with excellent results, with no uh, a bias of the reading and uh, easy to, to, uh, to do, it and also a bedside uh, tool, I think that uh, we should see it more and more in the horizon. Danny, do you want to ask a question? I think that there is a big difference between peripheral arteries and coronary arteries. We know that the coronary arteries tend to constrict and dilate more than the, the peripheral arteries. We know that plaque rupture occurs in the coronary, however, plaque rupture almost do not occur in the peripheral arteries. So this is a difference between them. The question is whether there was
Yao Ben Chorin, Shlomo Stern, myself, and we had other publications to show that there, is a, there are dynamic changes in the coronary fluid during daily activity in individual patients. So the coronary artery are much more dynamic than the peripheral artery. And still, we have to know whether there is a good correlation between these arteries and the coronary arteries. The blood rupture, I believe, is related to constriction and increased tonus of the coronary artery, increased wall space within the blood and rupture. Danny, in sake of time, didn't show this slide, but uh, Dr. Gantz and also Lehrman can tell you exactly that uh, several studies demonstrated an excellent correlation between uh, coronary uh, flow mediated dilation and coronary blood flow and also brachial reactivity. So there is correlation, generally speaking, but you know, the, in every test, sometimes you, know, you, you don't predict 100%. I wouldn't go to the legs, you know, if you want to see much more metabolic uh, abnormalities and impact of metabolic uh, syndrome, then I would definitely do the endo part, which is in a microcirculation compared to the uh, brachial artery reactivity, which is in the conduit uh, vessel. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks, Ron. Thanks for the opportunity to be here and be part of this uh, great symposium. And thanks for Itamar for their support. Um, Mickey set uh, a great stage to continue to talk about endothelial function as a marker for secondary prevention. There is a lot of overlap between primary and secondary, but I will try to focus in my talk mainly about secondary. And start with this case of 50-year-old young man with this evidence of cardiovascular risk factors history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, quit smoking 20 years ago, normal cardiac examination. He's on of a study in 80 milligram with baby aspirin, mildly overweight, a BMI of 28.5. This is uh, this person. This is this person, the laboratory uh, result, total cholesterol, HDL 39, LDL 62, GFR 45, CRP is normal. And the question we have, what's the risk of this patient for future cardiovascular event, and how would you determine the risk? So if we look at this patient and we look at it currently on this, most of the people in the audience will say that this is primary prevention risk about 7 8% if we have any event. Let's change the patient a little bit. And instead of a, uh, uh, talking about primary prevention, just say that this patient has uh, acute coronary syndrome and PCI with drug routine stand two weeks ago. Now, you look at this patient completely different, and now the risk of this patient is not 8%. So what happened to this patient just from being primary prevention to secondary prevention? So in spite of this patient normal lipid level, we look at two major studies, A to Z and approve it. Both of these relate to this patient, showing that the risk of having any event on this patient jumped to about 22% over a year in spite of the normal, almost normal cholesterol level. In here, in here the, the mid cholesterol, median cholesterol level in this study was 66, and here is 106. So here is a patient, secondary prevention, post ACS, was almost normal on natural study, and then here on starting uh, treatment, still have a high risk. And the question is, what are we missing in this patient? And can we trust this goal of lipids to uh, predict this patient event? So we're puzzled by this phenomenon, and I will bring this study that it's a fascinating study that came uh, two years ago in, in Nature that asked the same question, but asked it in the animal model, and it's maybe related to what we are talking today. 
So it's, we know that new myocardial ischemia have occurred in 54% of the patients after the first year after MI, in spite of aggressive and guidelines therapy. And they set an experiment to test to see what the mechanism is, what's the course of the atherosclerosis. So they took this model of the mice, creating an ACS, and showed that in the ACS itself, the event itself, is a huge trigger for progression of the atherosclerosis and plaque rupture. So when we have a patient with ACS, the event itself, it's a trigger event, and I'm not going to go into the mechanism of uh, where the cells are moving, but in a sense, this is a trigger by itself, and you cannot treat this patient as an innocent patient or innocent case like a primary prevention. So the event itself is a trigger for future myocardial infarction. From epidemiological study, we know that even in secondary prevention, in spite of treatment, you still have a high rate of event. And here you have a zero risk uh, intervention in primary secondary trial, still have high level of event, even with the, uh, aggressive treatment. So we need some tools to reclassify and assess the risk of this patient. And generally, multiple studies, including we know that a lot of patients with coronary disease, 77% that have normal cholesterol. We know from this study that uh, there is a duration and variation in, the, uh, in response to uh, event that trigger acute coronary syndrome, that nothing to do with the cholesterol or other risk factors. Some biomarkers fail to predict that. And even in the PROSPECT study that was an invasive ultrasound study, they didn't see how to predict the future event, even by invasive images. So how do we operate now in secondary prevention? We have this colorful table that I'm sure all of us are using on a daily basis, and we have guidelines. But if we look at this, the baseline, actually, the major parameters of secondary prevention remain with a lot of overlap with primary smoking, blood pressure, lipid management, physical activity. We don't have any tool specifically to assess the risk of patients with secondary prevention. So how do, we, how do we assess the risk of the patient? How do we know that this patient is vulnerable or not? So we have surrogate risk markers, high cholesterol, hypertension, smoking, diabetes, and biomarkers, but they're actually not the disease. They are biomarkers tell us there is a risk. But we have now tools to have direct imaging of the disease. We can do carotid ultrasound to look at plaque. There was some discussion of coronary calcium. And we can have some dynamic tests, which is endotelial function. So which test would you use to assess the risk of the patient? The test should, be, should make scientific sense, should make, somehow participate in the disease. A marker at a different stage of the disease, not only good for one stage, primary, secondary. It has to apply to multiple stages of the disease. What said here, it has to reflect reversibility, and that's what Peter commented. You need to have a tool to tell you, yes, I did the good job, because it's almost impossible or impossible to reverse coronary calcification. And it serves as a risk factor, not only as a risk marker. It has to have plain the disease, and it has to have a marker. <coughs> so we talk about endotelial function here, and it, this slide just shows the multiple effect of endotelial function. We shouldn't focus only on the vasoconstriction, vasodilatation. This is just a tool for us to assess the endothelial function. It has multiple effects that has to do with smooth muscle cell proliferation, leukocyte adhesion, lipid peroxidation, oxidative stress, platelet reactivity, and progenitor cells function. So it's a marker for us, it's a window for us to look at all this process of patient vulnerability. So Mickey showed these two major tests that are currently non-invasive tests for endothelial function reactive hyperemia and the endopath by Itamar, essentially based on the same mechanism of the response of reactive hyperemia and the de uh, decline in reactive hyperemia represent endothelial dysfunction. So if we want to introduce a test into our practice, and this was a question why endothelial function was not introduced into the practice, we believe that a test should uh, fulfill some of these criteria. It has to be associated with, with coronary endothelial function. And this is back to your question. Uh, regarding the relationship with endopath and coronary endothelial function, we previously showed that there is a very good correlation between them. The test has to be low risk, it has to be cost effective, no operator dependent, reproducible, easy to use, short duration, and reflect reversibility and predict event. So if we want to introduce a test to our practice, probably we need to look at this and say that this test fulfill this criteria. 
So how to assess the risk of the patient that we present? So we have endothelial dysfunction represent from us an ongoing risk. We know that, oh, we didn't have any, we have inadequate therapy to this patient, or oh, there is ongoing cardiovascular risk factors and unrecognized cardiovascular risk factors. So we look at this patient, we have endothelial dysfunction, we know it's a marker for us that the patient is still vulnerable for the next event. We need just to figure out what's the mechanism of that and act upon this mechanism. So what evidence do we have to support that what I just said about that? So we have, what is the risk of the current patient that I present? So we have risk of strength thrombosis and wrist stenosis. We have risk of cardiovascular event in this patient. We may missing some unrecognized risk factors, and we need to know that we provide optimal medical care. So regarding platelet reactivity, which is part of the milieu of a vascular and endothelial function, this study from Japan show that there is a good correlation between platelet reactivity and endothelial function. And a, plate, a patient that have high platelet reactivity has a attenuated endothelial function. So for us, it's a marker, in spite of the fact that you, we put all our patient on platelet inhibition, uh, for us, it's, it may be a marker that this patient is not responding to the antiplatelet therapy that we're giving him. What about cardiovascular event? Mickey showed a slide from Ronen, and this was mainly in patients with low Framingham risk factor. Uh, and we asked the question, does it apply to high risk factors like the patient that I presented? So complementary study show from Japan again, show the relationship of endothelial function in more than 500 patients with high cardiovascular risk. And they assessed endothelial function with the endopath and measured before coronary angiography and coronary uh, complexity was used the syntax score. So here we see that the presence of endothelial dysfunction had an additive effect on the syntax score. So you can have a patient with the same syntax score but completely different event rate. They can have the same syntax score, but if they have endothelial dysfunction, they have high, relative, high event rate. And this is true overall with endothelial dysfunction. So not only the patient with primary prevention, patient with secondary prevention with a high degree of coronary disease, endothelial dysfunction also is a good predictor of event. Is that prevalent or not? Are we just talking about a rare phenomenon? This is a, a study we're just finishing now, about 400 uh, patients following acute coronary syndrome. And all the patients underwent uh, endothelial function testing and sleep studies. And this just show you the prevalence of endothelial dysfunction and sleep uh, uh, studies, sleep abnormalities in patient with uh, following acute coronary syndrome. We focus here on the smoking, on the heart failure, and, and the cholesterol, but the incidence of continuous patient vulnerability is high. And I know that Giora is going to talk about sleep, but I just want to raise the issue that it is ongoing risk factor. So the vulnerable patient with endothelial dysfunction not only represents to us does this vessel dilate or constrict, it presents to us a multifunction disease that can be renal failure, metabolic syndrome, sleep apnea, and we need to detect which risk factors are we missing. Regarding sleep, Giora is going to talk about it, but in general, endothelial dysfunction is a sort of a surrogate for sleep apnea, and I think we're underestimating the prevalence of sleep apnea and the significance of this in cardiovascular event. Renal failure is another risk factor that we are missing because we keep looking on the same. And again, this study uh, with patients with chronic kidney disease and endothelial function was performed showing that the presence of uh, uh, endothelial dysfunction in this patient is a highly predictive of future cardiovascular event. So it's for us, it's a marker that our treatment or our detection of risk factors is not complete. Do, can we use endothelial function to provide optimal medical therapy? This is a study that highly related to the patient that I presented. So this is a study of patients with coronary disease, and the patients were all treated with statin to the same level of cholesterol level, 71 and 69. These are exactly the patients that we are seeing every day that give them statin. And we believe that we actually achieve a goal. However, if you can see that in the same level of cholesterol and same level of risk factors following with patients with coronary disease and secondary prevention, the, the regular risk uh, uh, model failed to pr predict event. However, the addition of non-invasive endothelial function was highly predictive 
of cardiovascular event, telling us that it's very simple to look at what we keep looking at, cholesterol and hypertension, but we need to look a little bit deeper even when we achieve a therapeutic and normal cholesterol. And finally, can we uh, target can we target our therapy based on that? Is it just a marker for us, or we can actually see that? So there are two studies, one in primary prevention and one in secondary prevention. Mickey showed the study on primary prevention, patient without significant coronary disease, uh, hypertension. And again, with a similar reduction in blood pressure, the patient with endothelial dysfunction continued to have event, which keep telling us that we are not achieving the goal. Secondary prevention, a similar story. We should be surprised, or not surprised, based on the data we have, that high percent of the patient, in spite of the guidelines therapy with stable coronary disease, continue to have endothelial dysfunction, in spite of the same blood pressure control, cholesterol control, and risk factor control. The patient, is there any difference in their event rate? On the same therapy, on a similar reduction in risk factors, the presence of endothelial dysfunction continuously have, this patient continue to have event, which means to us that in, uh, we are not finishing the job if we just f looking at the periphery of risk factors without looking at actually if this patient is continue to be vulnerable and have event in the future. So I think that endothelial dysfunction, we need the non-invasively, is a very helpful tool to reclassify the patient. And we have two studies that show that in the past this is 1,000 patient, and this is the 3,000 patient from the MESA study, showing again that the presence of endothelial function can serve as a reclassification. About 30 to 40 percent of the patient can be reclassified using this tool to high risk or low risk. And again, as Mickey showed, this is a study that showed a multivariate analysis showing, even in secondary prevention, that endothelial dysfunction is a high predictor of event. So, uh, and lastly, I just want you to uh, see how we practice, how we use it in our practice. So when we have patients with primary or secondary prevention with the risk factors treated, and they have normal endothelial function, we we'll continue with the same management. If we have a patient and we treat them and they have endothelial dysfunction, it's a sign for us that there's ongoing CV risk and event. There is ongoing vascular, vascular injury in this patient that may continue to present with acute coronary syndrome. So we need to look at other, we need to look at platelet reactivity, presence of sleep, metabolic syndrome, and we can modify the current management until we achieve not only regu regulation of the risk factors, but also normalization of endothelial function. Just to remember, we usually as old as your blood vessel. Thank you. <laughs> Just a reminder if somebody wants to visit us. <laughs> During the summer. No, this is January, this is February, and this is March and April. <laughs> Thank you very much, Amir. It was wonderful. Any questions from the audience to Dr. Lerman? Shmuli? Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, If we look at the Jupiter study with the apparently healthy patient, mean, median LDL of 107, and it was the same like you, LDL below 70, but CRP remained high, it's intermediate. It's like you have a high LDL and low CRP. Is there a good correlation between endothelial dysfunction and CRP? You know, so we can use both. It is additive on top of this. And the second is, what we do, we still have endothelial dysfunction despite LDL 70, yeah. Very, very good question. So regarding the first question, uh, regarding the correlation with CRP, um, when the endothelial function error started uh, many years ago, there was a small study about, uh, from Andreas Reir, about 20, 25 patients that saw some correlation between coronary endothelial dysfunction and CRP level. Since then, uh, uh, most of the groups that dealt with endothelial function, and I'll let Peter also comment, we were not able to find any correlation with endothelial function CRP doesn't mean that the first study was wrong, but it means that it may be look at a different thing. And CRP is more of a, not a specific vascular uh, uh, marker. If you look in the other markers like LPPLA2, you may see in some more uh, correlation. But in general, we didn't see any correlation with CRP uh, in our large uh, database. 
Uh, the second question about what do you do about it, I usually, usually it's as a marker that I didn't do, I didn't do a completely good job. So if, it depends on, on, for instance, if we talk about women, uh, we usually focus, for instance, on history of polycystic ovaries, uh, try met metformin, a history of toxemia of pregnancy, uh, stress, things like that. Uh, if it's a secondary prevention, as I said, we're missing majority of the sleep uh, apnea patient. We, we don't look at this. Uh, rheumatoid disease, Im immunological disease can, you know, if you have patient with rheumatoid arthritis with the same cholesterol level, the patient with rheumatoid arthritis has accelerated atherosclerosis, and I think Peter uh, can, can comment on that too. So I think it's, for me, it's a marker that something is, going, something is going wrong and I need to look at this. And so I usually look at that, try to identify the cause, try to treat that, and do another non-invasive endothelial function six months down the road to see. I also, we also use it for patients with chest pain, uh, with normal coronaries, to have a screen diagnosis and to see if we have the right treatment for them. From a practical point of view, a practical point of view um, you reduce the LDL and you see that the endothelial function is still uh, reduced and you go to other factors. Do you have information that taking care of all the other factors like sleep apnea, etc., will bring the endothelial function to normal? I, we, we, don't, we have studies from the sleep apnea. I don't want to steal the, the talk from Giora, but from the, from the sleep apnea, there are, there are some studies uh, that I'm sure Giora will show about the uh, treatment of not necessarily directly the, the uh, sleep apnea, but indirectly maybe the mechanism of sleep apnea that improve that. We have studies from uh, uh, health uh, of lifestyle modification that improve endothelial function. We have studied with the large in that show that, and, and by the way, back to your question about coronary calcification. If, if you have the patient, the patient has normal endothelial function, the chance of this patient to have coronary calcification is almost zero. So, um, Amir, yeah. um, can you tell us, uh, uh, is there any uh, norms that are different for uh, women versus men for defining normal versus abnormal endothelial function. And also, um, is a function of age. I mean, whether you take a 75 years old gentleman and you define what's normal or abnormal, or for example, you take 40 years old. I mean, age and gender. Okay, so age, let's start with, uh, with age. Um, there is a difference in the literature between FMD and, and endopath, and, and I think these two technologies do not compete with each other. Uh, the FMD more looking at the large vessels, the endopath is more, have more focus on the microcirculation. Um, in the FMD literature, uh, there are several studies in the early stage that show a negative correlation between age and endothelial function. So, I mean, in the endopath, uh, the correlation is not that strong. And, and it's actually an advantage because it, not every age has the same effect on the blood flow. So you can, you can have, you can be a 70 with a normal endothelial function, you can be 45 as abnormal, and I think it reflects your risk and vulnerability. Regarding the uh, effect of sex, um, the, there is a difference. We need more patients, but there is a difference in this endopath score between men and women. FMD was not, was not that strong. Uh, what we see in our population, there is high incidence, high prevalence of endothelial dysfunction in women versus men, but not necessarily the, their score. And that reflects the higher prevalence of microvascular disease in women. But Amir, in, uh, can I just uh, follow up on this? So if the woman is premenopausal, then you have the additional complexity of, uh, at least for the brachial reactivity, of the number changing during the ovarian yeah. cycle. Uh, have you seen that with endopad also? I think there is study now, uh, they're doing it, uh, look at the variability. Uh, I, I'm not aware of uh, endopad uh, result, but I think in the FMD there was one and on some variability. And also there was some variability about uh, during the day that it, you have more, uh, more endothelial dysfunction in the early hours of the morning that may reflect why you have more acute coronary syndrome in the early hours of the morning. And I would say on the, on, the, on the good part, the question is how do we transition from endothelial function testing for research versus office-based. Okay. And I would say 
the, fa the issue of fasting, you know, we used to do all these studies in a fasting state. It's probably not as critical as we no. used to think. We used to stop medications. That's probably also not so critical for, for, for doing a study. So I don't know what your opinion is. So for, for fasting, we uh, usually, it depends on where we usually use about two hours of, of fasting for the clinical practice. And for research, it's a little bit different. But uh, we have several machines that are staging in our cardiovascular health clinic, and we use it pretty often. And the same technician that's doing this, the stress is actually using the endothelial function. So we usually require about uh, two hours of uh, fasting uh, and no smoking, um, not before and not during the test. Um, and uh, um, regarding the medication, I think it depends what the question is. Uh, I think it depends. If the patient is already taking some medication, if we still have a question if this is a risk, we don't discontinue the medication. So we keep the medication. It depends what the clinical question is. Yeah, Professor Stupin. In recent years, we have more and more data about the impact of renal function on, uh, and, yeah. and on cardiovascular events. And one of the ways that uh, renal uh, function is affecting cardiovascular systems is endothelial function. That's correct. You're right. And uh, uh, the, the most prominent predictor of event in any cardiac study is GFR. I mean, the strongest one forever. And I think if you look at the mechanism of reduction GFR, it has to do with microvascular endothelial dysfunction in the kidney that create mediated this effect. So I think it does have reflect on multisystemic microvascular endothelial dysfunction. Uh, in, so I think that if you see that, it may give you some kind of a sign that there is, maybe there is some kidney disease there or something that you need to do. You're right. Well, that's great, terrific uh, talk. And uh, thank you very much, Amir. I'd like to invite uh, Giora Pilar from Carmel Medical Center to talk about sleep apnea and endothelial function. Thank you very much. I feel a little bit like uh, Safta Bishla Daisa. Everyone took the time and, uh, and I left with about uh, 10 or 15 minutes, but uh, it should be enough. Um, uh, my role here is to talk about, uh, about uh, sleep and specifically uh, sleep apnea. Presumably this is a disease of sleep because when we are awake, we breathe normally. The, the dilator muscles, pre predominantly the genioglossus, but also the, the soft palate or the tensor veli palatini and other muscles uh, are uh, active and allow a normal uh, breathing and airflow behind it. What happens in these patients during sleep is that they collapse due to the negative pressure uh, generated by the diaphragm and obstruct uh, the airway and the patients uh, suffer from, from uh, apneas. This is how it looks like in uh, polysomnography. The effort to breathe means that this is not a central problem. They try to breathe, but they are obstructed, so there is no airflow, and they suffer from apnea, 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 until the point where they wake up. This is a sign in the EG of, of arousal, and their sleep is fragmented. They keep on arousing, and uh, with uh, everything that is uh, accompanied with uh, oxygen desaturation, uh, CO2 accumulation, uh, sympathetic activation, etc. So all of these uh, are the mechanisms that generate uh, the problems in, the, in the sleep apnea. We used to do it in polysomnography, as you see here. One of the biggest revolutions, and actually it is a, a revolution in the field of sleep, is uh, moving from uh, in-lab studies into in-home studies, and uh, definitely Itamar Medical is a pioneer in this, both in Israel and in the rest of the world. Uh, many, many uh, sleep uh, centers uh, are now uh, examining sleep apnea in the home, how it should be, because it's a disease of uh, sleep, and the patients should sleep in their own environment, and, uh, and this technique uh, is very, very common now. What we do, we measure the severity of sleep apnea by two uh, different measures. Number one is the apnea, hypopnea, or respiratory disturbance index, how many events per each hour of sleep, and what is the minimal oxygen desaturation. The reason that these two uh, measures were chosen as the, as the assessment for the severity is that they have the, they have the best 
prediction value for uh, complications and uh, mortality. And today I'm going to talk only about one complication uh, because this is the topic of, of us uh, today. And this is the cardiovascular complication and the uh, endothelial function. So this is a, a study back uh, some 10 uh, years ago in Lancet uh, of 12 uh, years of uh, uh, follow-up of patients with untreated sleep apnea, you see it here in red, and comparing to all the others with mild or no sleep apnea or treated uh, sleep apnea. And we can see that those with untreated uh, uh, sleep apnea, moderate to severe, have significantly more fatal and non-fatal cardiovascular uh, events. And the mechanism that was back then a hypothesis, but today it is proven, and I'm going to show you some data about it, is that all these interim uh, complications of sleep apnea go through endothelial dysfunction, and this results in, in the cardiovascular complications. And I want to take you uh, into some of the studies that are uh, proving this uh, hypothesis. Uh, some, I, I will show both uh, our own studies and some uh, others. We use uh, the, the reactive hyperemia based on the endopath, but I'll show also some flow-mediated uh, dilatation and other uh, studies. So we, we started to study the to study this about uh, 10 years ago. Our first study, we took about 50 patients with uh, obstructive sleep apnea, and we studied their endothelial function both in the evening before uh, they went to sleep and in the morning, the first thing after they woke up. Uh, let me jump uh, through this. Uh, showed the before, and here are the results. This is from our study. This is from a parallel study that was done uh, uh, by Mary Eep. Uh, they did it with the flow mediate, the mediation dilatation uh, in the brachial ultrasound. We did, we did it with the peripheral arterial tonometry. Uh, and both uh, we reported a, a strong negative correlation. The, the worse the sleep apnea is, here what you see is the apnea hypopnea index. Uh, as we go to higher numbers, it's more fragmented sleep, more apneas per each hour of sleep, the worse the endothelial function is. Uh, both uh, measured by the uh, PAT and measured by the uh, FMD. Then uh, we studied the, another thing. What happens uh, through the night? This is uh, the endothelial, the average uh, of the group endothelial function in the evening uh, compared to the endothelial function in the morning. Now, this is very abnormal. Sleep usually is a restored, has a restorative function. Most of us, most of healthy population, when, the, when we go to sleep, our endothelial, uh, uh, well, every, uh, a lot of uh, functions uh, restore. Among them, also the endothelial function and the most healthy people wake up with better endothelial function uh, in the morning than in the, in the evening. Not patients with sleep apnea, because they experience throughout the night hypoxemia, reoxygenation, hypercapnia, and sympathetic activation, arousals, all of these uh, um, interim mechanisms damage the endothelial function, and they actually wake up in the morning with worse endothelial function than they went to sleep in the evening. Now, when we divided the, these patients into two groups, those who had only sleep apnea, you see, it, you see them here in green, compared to those who already have a complication of the cardio, uh, who had at least one uh, cardiovascular event or, or were diagnosed with, with uh, ischemic uh, heart disease, and look what we found. Those with, without cardiovascular with, uh, disease, with only sleep apnea, had a better endothelial function, both in the evening and in the morning. But in these patients, we, we saw a strong deterioration overnight. As opposed to those patients who already suffer from cardiovascular disease, their endothelial function is lower to begin with. And the deterioration overnight is, is mild, because probably they have a, a, a floor effect, and their endothelial function is anyway uh, very, very low. So this actually is very encouraging to diagnose and to detect these patients early, as early as uh, we can. And it is uh, substantial and very important because it is reversible to some point uh, or to some extent at, uh, at least. 
And here, as Amir said, uh, there are several studies showing it. I'll show you some of them. Here is the CPAP treatment, three months from our lab, uh, uh, before treatment, after three months of uh, CPAP. Look at the, uh, the uh, significant improvement in the endothelial uh, function. This is a different study. The, the, they, I, I should give them the credit. They were the first one who did it uh, from the lab of uh, Mary. They did the patients with sleep apnea with FMD, then after, after several uh, weeks on CPAP, and then after again several, or sometimes one day, and some, in some of the cases several days without sleep apnea, they deteriorate. So it, it shows a, a, a strong causality between the sleep apnea and, and the, the endothelial function. On CPAP it improves, without CPAP it deteriorates again. Last study that I do want to show, uh, which is very, very important in the field of sleep, but I think also in the cardiology field, is what about not CPAP? CPAP is a very, very difficult uh, uh, treatment to cope with, and the compliance is, uh, re is relatively very low, at least in Israel. In some, in some uh, states it's better. But uh, there is alternative treatment, and here we studied the uh, actually with, uh, with uh, collaborators uh, from, uh, from uh, California, um, a, a, a different study which is called an oral appliance. This is a herbs, but there are several other uh, appliances. And what it does is it moves the lower jaw forward. And it, uh, the mandible, it moves it forward. And with the mandible, the tongue, the genioglossus moves forward and allows better airflow behind the genioglossus. It is much. I, I, I can't say that it's convenient, but it's much less inconvenient than uh, CPAP. So we, we took, it, it was a small study, we took 16 patients, but it was a very long study. We followed them up for uh, one year. We studied them at baseline after three months of treatment, after, after one year of treatment, and then after uh, uh, seizing uh, treatment again. Six of them had severe sleep apnea. Six of them had already uh, have uh, hypertension. And look at the results. And I think this is a, this is a very, very uh, important uh, concept. And the, um, the anterior mandibular device or the oral appliances are not as good as CPAP. And the treatment, you, you see the apnea hypopnea index improved, but did not improve to a level of controlling the disease as we have with the CPAP. So reducing the apnea hypopnea index from 29 to 18 uh, after three months and to, to 19 after one year of follow-up definitely improved their sleep apnea. But if we take a patient and study him at, at any time point and we see 18 or 19 or 20 uh, apnea hypopnea index, we will still say that this patient suffers from sleep apnea. Yet. Despite the fact that we did not uh, cure sleep apnea, we only improved it, look what happened to the endothelial function. This is the endothelial function at baseline after three months, after one year. Endothelial function dramatically improved despite of residual sleep apnea. And this is, <clears throat> I think, very important. There was a, a, a nice positive correlation between the degree of improvement in the sleep apnea and the degree of the improvement in uh, endothelial function. So what we concluded from that study was that the mandibular advancement splint or the herbs uh, oral appliance is an effective treatment in patients with sleep apnea at least for one year of follow-up, improving both breathing and endothelial function. The correlation between the improvement in apnea indices and endothelial function suggests that the res respiratory abnormality causes the vascular abnormality, and the improvement in the endothelial function to control levels like, like uh, health is without a complete uh, elimination of apneic events suggests a threshold effect of sleep apnea on endothelial function. And I want to conclude my talk. I see that, that uh, the food is coming in. So sleep apnea is strongly associated with cardiovascular uh, disease. The interim mechanism is endothelial function. I didn't uh, show all the data, but there is much more than what I had time to show. Endothelial dysfunction in obstructive sleep apnea results from both hypoxemia, reoxygenation, and sympathetic activation. Again, I had to skip uh, showing these data, but there are a lot of uh, studies uh, supporting this. Treatment of obstructive sleep apnea reverses endothelial dysfunction if treated early. 
and reduces cardiovascular complications. There is a nice uh, uh, New England uh, uh, study about it about a year and a half uh, ago. And finally, there is a threshold effect of obstructive sleep apnea on endothelial dysfunction and even and even suboptimal treatment may be advantageous. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Pilar. Any questions from the audience? Yes, Professor Tsivoni. The microphone. Just want to make the remark that we serve here endothelial function, healthy food. Yeah. Uh, I would like to, for, from this lecture, I learned that endothelial dysfunction is variable during the same day. It you is. have a different threshold in the morning and in the evening. Uh, Are there any uh, studies to show that patients with acute coronary syndrome, they have worse endothelial uh, function Compared to, let's say, three months later or three months earlier, do we have any data to show that dynamic changes in endothelial function play a role in acute coronary syndrome? The question is there for. Yeah, it's not for you. Yeah, it? I know. <laughs> you want to come we have experience and we publish this in uh, normal volunteers, not with patients with uh, heart disease, but uh, normal uh, volunteers early in the morning when we wake them up at 6 a.m., they have a much better, much worse endothelial dysfunction than if we measure the endothelial, the same, endothelial, same patients after 10 a.m. And even as our publication also with normal volunteers without coronary disease, that early in the morning they have uh, endothelial dysfunction or less endothelial uh, function than in the evening. I don't know about uh, patients with coronary disease. What is the best time of the day in terms of your endothelial function? Usually we uh, assess them at about uh, 7 uh, a.m. in the morning. This is the best. 7 and 8? 7 in the morning, 7 a.m. It should be said that food, that uh, food. affects, uh, affects yeah. uh, the measure, smoking affects the measure, so it, it needs to be measured in the same uh, uh, conditions and usually after at least uh, three hours of fasting, so early in the morning is probably the best. Uh, and the tiller function is uh, very f fluctuative. It changes all the time. Please. It, uh, it uh, correlates with blood pressure, but uh, it's not the only factor. If we examine a nutrient function in a patient at 8 o'clock today and at 8 o'clock tomorrow, uh, their blood pressure will be different and the nutrient function will be different. Uh, we know that blood pressure is the highest in the early morning hours. It's lower, significantly lower in the afternoon. And the uh, endothelial function correlates. Now, it is questioned whether the blood pressure itself affects endothelial function or it's a surrogate endpoint because when blood pressure is higher in the morning, catecholamine levels are higher, angiotensin levels are higher, and the elevation of those factors affect uh, endothelial function. So uh, one of the main problems is to create measurements that will reflect, will have a value as a measurement, and we can uh, get different results in different periods of time. And uh, it's really a problem of standardization. Baseline levels should be very well defined. OK. Thank you for this remark. Um, any more questions? Maybe I can ask Giora one question. Giora, there was a study in circulation from Colombia by Yelitz mm -hmm. who showed that many diabetics who were not suspected of having obstructive sleep apnea in fact had it, and they had endothelial dysfunction more than the other diabetics who didn't have obstructive sleep apnea. So. How do, you, how do you view diabetics in terms of screening for obstructive sleep apnea? And 
tell us about some of your criteria for screening patients for looking for OSA. Well, I think it's a complex uh, relationship. I agree with you. Uh, uh, it's not only that pa that circulation paper; uh, others showed it uh, as well. And, uh, and Amir just said that uh, that he thought that that endothelial function can be a marker of sleep apnea. I think it's it's diabetes, hypertension, and and a lot. Uh, and sleep apnea is another uh, risk factor. I cannot uh, tell you how to how to put everything together in one in one uh, package. Uh, um, I think uh, I think uh, sleep apnea should be a word and uh, recognized as a substantial risk factor. All the data shows it, um, and diabetes should be uh, recognized as an independent, although they do de depend on each other. But it, it is an independent uh, risk factor. I don't know if I answered your question, but. Uh, My Okay. Okay. I, I have actually a comment to all the speakers and to the company from arrhythmia studying that it's not enough to have a rhythm strip, you need a halter. From blood pressure uh, um, um, management, we learned that you need uh, ambulatory blood pressure monitor. From what you learn from endothelial <clears throat> sensitivity, you learn that you need to have a halter-like device that will measure the endoth endothelial reactivity several times during the day. And then you can know what it means. Yeah. I, I have a question. Uh, I have a question to Amir or Mickey or Peter about uh, the value of um, endopath in monitoring uh, complex uh, therapeutics. For example, if you have a patient who receives um, cardiotoxic uh, or uh, chemo uh, therapeutic agents for uh, cancer, biologic agents for um, autoimmune disease or for cancer as well, um, do you know whether this can be used in order to monitor in order to change algorithm, in order to provide some alarms uh, during the course of the treatment, um, Mir. It's a good, it's a great question, and uh, we, like other centers, start having uh, something called cardio oncology clinic, where we actually have a combination of oncologists and cardiologists, because most of the patients with cancer now actually survive in the cancer and die from cardiovascular disease. Uh, w there are several drugs that have vascular toxicity. Majority of them have cardiac toxicity, but a lot of them have vascular toxicity. Uh, particularly uh, breast cancer women with aromatase inhibitors, they this have a strong vascular toxicity. We do use it in our cardio-oncology to follow this patient. They are coming every seven months or six months for echo, and we do add it as an indicator for vascular toxicity. We have a similar thing with a patient getting 5-FU. We see the similar effect, and we sometimes, in some, some physicians actually are adding statin when they see endothelial dysfunction. Uh, in this patient, although their cholesterol is level normal, you can add low level, uh, low dose uh, uh, simvastatin, like 10 milligram, not as a cholesterol lowering, but as a vascular protector. So the answer is yes, we use it and uh, we, we react upon that. Now, regarding some of the questions here, I think the, the, the message is that, that endothelial dysfunction is just give you a, a, a wake-up call that something is wrong. And I think that you need to react on that, that you're missing some uh, risk. Uh, the patient is still vulnerable. One area that we are actually pursuing with other groups is the, uh, back to the arrhythmia with a, a patient with an atrophy relation. The presence of uh, paroxysmal and atrophy relation is, a, um, is associated with endothelial dysfunction. So, it reflects some vulnerability that we are missing something. Are there any further questions? I agree with Zamir. We also demonstrate, we also show this in our clinic. Patients with, on, on chemo, that the, the, the endothelial function is blunted, and after a while, and we, as, as we, uh, we are very familiar with this, we load them not just with statins, but with magnesium, and improving uh, uh, the endothelial function. And also, by the way, also the, the, the LV function and, and improving the, the general function. Thank well, you, Mickey. Are there any other questions from the audience? 
So I think that uh, we are going to conclude uh, the scientific part of the session, but the culinary part is continuing without interruption. Uh, I would like to thank uh, again Itamar Medical, the sponsors uh, and the organizers of this session. Uh, I think it was a great session. And obviously the speakers, all three of them did a great job. And for you, the audience, uh, have a great continued uh, Israeli heart meeting until the end. Thank you very much. And Thank you. And uh, be, be aware of your endothelial function. It is very, very important.